And so, so I, I, I want to talk to you about Joseph because God has put his finger on Joseph. And um, there's some things we have to understand about him, things that we have to condition ourselves for. And we want to pray somehow for you guys. I don't know how, I'd love to play hands on. We just got to lay hands on everybody. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know. You're going to figure that out. I'm going to figure it out. Yeah, there we go. You're working on it. Good. Let me give you two scriptures. Let me give you two scriptures. Let me give you two scriptures as, as a guide for that. And they would be Proverbs 18, 16, and Psalms 105, 19. Psalms 105, 19 is David when he's writing about uh, uh, in the Psalms. He's, he's writing and about Joseph. And he said this. I want you to hear this. Until his time came. Speaking of Joseph, we are a Joseph generation. I know it, I know it, I know it, I know it. We're at the tipping point of a Joseph generation. He said, until his time came, the word of the Lord tested Joseph. I don't know about you, but I'm testing, being tested that I'm tested out. It's like, that's like, are there any more tests? I've already flunked them all. I don't want to flunk anymore. Anymore, I'm just test, test, test. And is that, so, but until, until his word came. This is Joseph who changed the complexion of the whole world, saved it from a drought, went to the, uh, uh, from prison to, to, the, to Pharaoh's throne and uh, saved grain and, and saved lives and uh, brought the economy roaring back. Then that place would have been uh, done with without Joseph. But until his time came, until that time, that great door was open to him, that prison door that brought him to the throne of Pharaoh and his anointing that God put on his life, uh, that double blessing that he had, and that dream interpretation, that prophetic anointing that he had. Until that time came, the word of the Lord tried him. I don't know if you're aware of it, but you're being tried. This is not a revival. This is a testing time that we're in. This is not a time where we're at the gate, you know, ready to run with the horses. This is a time where we're in the stall being tested to see because God's hand is staying on us and he's testing us. But it is about time for that testing to end. And Proverbs 18 puts it this way. 18, 16 says, For your gift will make room for you and bring you before great leaders and kings. There are people in this room that in a year or two or three or four or whatever, five years, are going to be standing in king's palaces in great places and saying great things. Listen, the whole, this whole thing is changing. It's just not just about the church anymore. It's about the world. And it's about high places in the world. And if you think God is just training us, equipping us so that we have a greater ministry, you're really wrong. God's equipping Joseph and God's training us and giving, going to give us a jailbreak to send to the highest places in society into the throne rooms of Pharaoh to be able to save ter- uh, the world or the world, at least the nation, from terrible things that the nation is facing, facing and that are in our lifetime. I believe that. No, I, I know that, and I've always known that, and I've been, it's been a long journey, you know, waiting for that and understanding that, uh, but I am so close, I can smell it. I can smell it. So, when I was standing there with the little bottles in my, my hand, I felt in my pants pocket, and I had, to add to it, I had a dime and three pennies. That's all I had to my life. I went in a car that was, that was, that smoked a lot. By the way, it was a Chevy too. But anyway, so, so <clears throat> it has been a long journey, a long time. And I've had a lot of doors open in my life. But the door that God spoke to me about nearly 50 years ago, or maybe 51 years ago, the door is yet to be open. But I heard it. Look, guys, I heard it. I heard it last night. I heard it the night before. I heard it when I walked in here. There are doors of access. There are doors that are about to be open in your life, things that have been kept from you, things that have been delayed, things that have uh, hurt you, that the enemy has harassed you, and people have harassed you, all the opposition, all the stuff you've been going through. There is a door, the same door that was open to Paul when he was in prison at midnight and beaten to a pulp and look like he had no future. And as he praised and worshiped, a great earthquake came and the door was opened up into him and he walked right out of an open door. And to one of his greatest ministries uh, of his lifetime happened after that. So I'm telling you, this is not just another sermon. This is just not just another night 
uh, this is this is this is a transitional anointing. Uh, catch the fire, start the fire, get ready for something that's coming. However, however, until that time comes, the word of the Lord tested Joseph. And what does that mean? What does it mean to be a Joseph? I just told you kind of what it means to be a Joseph. We'll find Joseph in all the high places. Uh, Josephs are not just meant for pulpits. Josephs are meant for governor's offices, for presidential offices, for business, for IBM, for, for marketplace. For uh, Josephs, Josephs are everywhere. And although Israel was so blessed with great men of God, the Old Testament and the church, and from as, as much as Moses and Aaron in the church and the tabernacle in the wilderness, and also uh, the churches after that, Solomon's temple, etc. There were still Daniels and Josephs, and I, I'm telling you, and 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 men and women of valor, men and women of education, men and women of prowess, or men and women of dreams, and all, that changed the world, not just the church. Our vision is too small. It's just too small. God, listen. If God doesn't help us make a move on this planet. It's, it's going to be a rough next two or three generations. We have to do it. So I'm going to run a few things by you. About, let me actually uh, things I've learned as a Joseph in this testing place. And uh, I have not learned all of these, but at least the things the Lord has said to me and dealt with me about being a Joseph. What, what do you do? How do you prepare? Nothing great happens without preparation. Preparation is the door, the way that you have to go through to the great thing that God has called you to. So I'm just going to give you, I got, nine, I got, I got I just, they're just one-liners. I got 22 of them, but they're just one-liners, and I'll go through them quickly. And I don't mean that you have to measure up to this, and this is not a test. I just want you to be aware of the complexity of what it means to be a Joseph and what you have to learn and what you have to open your heart to and your spirit to and how you have to let God into your life in a way that you have never let God into your life when it seems like everything else is going crazy, it's not going to happen, it's not going to work until your time comes. Though Not the devil, the word of the Lord, try Joseph. Some of you think it's what's happening to you is the devil when it's God's restraint in your life because you're not ready. I'm talking about me. So let me go through it. Number one, Joseph's are not called to be a problem. Joseph's are called to be a problem solver. God is going to raise up in the body of Christ problem solvers. There has, I have been a problem to a lot of churches in my life, I'm sure, and a lot of people in my life, I'm sure, and I've been a problem in a lot of ways. But I, I've always been aware of this, and the Lord has always said to me, Larry, you're, never, you're not called to make things worse. You're called to make them better. You're not called to be a problem. You're called to be a problem solver. Whatever you do, find a way to solve a problem. Don't be a part of the problem. Don't critique the problem. Don't get angry with the problem. Find a way to solve the problem because that is a Joseph DNA. So number one, I don't know that I've done that that well, but at least I know that and I've tried that. Number two, I can complain, which is basically number one. I can complain about the problem or be a solution to the problem. This world is full of problems. This nation's full of problems. I am tired of listening about all the problems. I can hardly watch TV anymore. The news is killing me. I can't do it anymore. I'm saying, I know what's going on. I know it's bad. This nation doesn't need to hear about another problem. We need an answer to the problem. And the answer to the problem is not what is there. The answer to the problem is the Josephs that God has so ordained in this time that we're living in to, I'm just going to say it, to save the world, to save the nation, to save civilization in, in a way that you probably wouldn't understand or I wouldn't understand. I mean, this is dire time. There's some really interesting things coming our way. And God has never been without a man, without a woman on the earth to change the complexion of the earth, never. No matter what has happened, whether it be a Moses, whether it be Abraham, whether it be a Paul, whether it be a... God is never without a man or a woman. And it only takes one or two to change everything. So, number three, the world doesn't need my opinion. It needs my authentic gift. The world doesn't need my opinion. It needs my authenticity. Not only does it need not, it is not, not opinion, it needs my God gift. In other words, you, we're this big mosaic, we're this great puzzle, we're this big puzzle of people. And every piece of the puzzle, if you put a puzzle together, is different. And if you wonder why it takes so long, have you ever tried to put a puzzle together 
It just takes some time to do that. And it's taken a long time to God to put the puzzle of people together that we are to create this beautiful mosaic or this beautiful picture that we are. And you are one of those pieces of the puzzle. And if just one piece is missing, the puzzle is not complete. It's called the body of Christ. And for the one, he's given this. To another, he's given this complexion. To another, he's given this authenticity. To another, he's given this size, this shape, this color, this depth. And the body of Christ coming together to create this beautiful picture, this authentic gift that the world needs is what he's doing. He's not looking for just your single opinion. He's looking for a corporate voice. He's looking for all of us to be able to say together what God has put together, what God has done is bigger than each of us. It is collective. It is all of us. And when you have an army like that or a puzzle like that, when I say a puzzle or a picture that you put together, like you get to see the whole picture and the full impact of that picture. And I feel like God is really working hard to put the puzzle together and put people together. The problem is, if you ever tried to put a puzzle in the wrong place, mm, that's tough. You ever tried to make it? I've gotten irritated and tried to hammer it in. <laughs> that's called trying to fit into the body. But anyway, so number four, <laughs> the world doesn't need my diagnosis. It needs my help. This nation doesn't need another diagnosis of what we should or shouldn't, shouldn't do. You know, it doesn't need a, it doesn't need a, a sideline, you know, uh, coach anymore. It doesn't need, it needs not just my diagnosis and saying this is what's wrong. It needs me and you to get up and go do something about it. Right. I mean, we have, to, we have to put feet to the diagnosis. And so I'm trying. It's called helps. I, some of it's called, they're, 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 the Bible is clear that there is a ministry called helps ministry. And I don't know if you know how, but I think it's needed worse than apostle, prophet, evangelist. But I, right now, the thing that we're deficit in is the ministry of helps. I think the world is crying help, and God has put in the church that helps the ministry to help. And the problem with helping is you're usually not, if you're in a helps position or if you help, you're not the number one person. You're the helper that's helping the number one person. So I don't want to go be the president. I want to go to be the IBM guy. I don't want to go be Pharaoh. I don't want to go be what, but I would like to be the one to help with that for them to succeed to be what God has called them to be so that God can better shape this nation and this civilization, our generation, for something that is extraordinary that probably hasn't lived since in the last five or 600 years. I really believe that we are at the very edge of a renaissance moment that will reshape everything. Yeah, it cr it's critical. This is critical, 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 critical. People don't need a lecture from me. They need to find a friend in me. They don't need a lecture from me. They need to find a friend in me. I don't know about you, but I'm done with lectures. <laughs> People telling me, maybe you're done with that. And I'm not looking for another inf uh, a source of information from someone or someone to enhance my capacity to understand something, that's all right. That's wonderful. I, teaching is a big part of the church, but we need friendship as much or more than when you just need another teaching or just another gifting. Listen, people don't need, just don't need your input and your information. People are looking for friends and friendship. And I've said it over and over again, friends are Jesus in disguise. We're saying God send revival, and he brings someone in front of us. God send your answer, he brings someone, in someone in front of us. God send this, God help me this. Then someone says, hey, how can I do, what can I do for, I mean, that Jesus and the way he manifests himself are friends in disguise. And Joseph was a friend to Pharaoh. Joseph was a friend to a butler and a baker in the bottom of a prison. Joseph was a friend of Benjamin. Joseph became a friend to his whole family. Jo Joseph, more than just this amazing man in the bottom of, of this prison that was, that was lied about and that was thrown into prison and that was done wrong, had this sense of forgiveness in his heart and friendship in his heart that he held on to nothing other than the capacity to be a friend of the world and make the place that God had put him a better place. I'm in. Uh, can I ask you a question? Larry? Please, please. Because you made a couple of statements about, oh, I'm sorry. I, I was hoping you'd do that. Uh, the gift of help. Yes. What I thought I heard you say was it, it, you see it existing to serve those who are in leadership can or be. those who are. I, I have to really, 
leadership world. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking outside of the walls of the church, too. Okay. So when we think about, like, maybe somebody that walks with the gift of healing or the gift of teaching, we go, like, oh, Randy Clark is a gift of, you know, walks and healings, yeah. miracles, signs, and wonders. You know, Bill, incredible teaching gift. Yeah. You, incredible teaching gift. Who would you say someone that we would all know walks in the gift of help? I don't know like a really, reference point. I don't really know anybody really wants to do that, <laughs> <laughs> no, because it, it is it is not not being the visible, it's not being the seen, it's not being on top. It's 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 the it's the foundation that holds up the building. It's the yeah. it's the helps. It's the one that does the unpraised parts of yeah. of the work. It is that's yeah. that's 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 hard. So it's, it says apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, yeah. right? Those with the gift of administration and those with the gift of help. Yeah. Can I? Just throw in one little nugget, please, because that really excited me. Because you don't hear a lot of people preach about that. Yeah. Those two, they go apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist. Yeah, and or people that are like lukewarm, they're like, I don't. I'll just have the gift of help, or I'll just have the gift of, you yeah. know, administration. Like I'm really good at lining things up. That's not what those gifts are. No, at all. Like just because you are a natural administrator doesn't mean that you have the gift of administration. And if you Say treat just because you're a natural administrator right. or you're like really helpful Absolutely. doesn't mean that you are walking in that gift. True. Because I need in ministry, and you know this, right? Mm -hmm. We need administrators. We need people that, that serve and help. And we've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds go through Iris. Yeah. And what I look for are people that actually look at the gift of admin and the gift of help the same way that I look at my calling. They treat it with holiness, reverence. It is it is a priority in their life. It isn't like a natural skill set. Would you want to just sit with a speaker or sit under a teacher that just has a natural teaching skill set? Or do you want somebody that's like anointed, called? They treat it as, as something set apart unto the Lord. So I, I just think just because you might have, be like, oh, I'm a helper. I like helping people. I bake yeah. cookies or whatever. You know, I chop wood and mow lawns. Or be, like, that's not what what it is. It's actually something that you treat with the same yeah. reverence that you would expect Larry to teach the, like, carry the prophetic. Yeah. Does that make sense? So. And help build, I mean, in the Old Testament, when they rebuilt the wall and the, and the temple, et cetera, they all, they all, you know, went to the top, they all built it yeah. together, you know, brick and mortar. There was, they, they helped, you know. Yeah. There was eventually a king, there was eventually prophets, et cetera. Yeah. But it was uh, uh, much built on the ministry of help. By the way, an analogy, you preached uh, some, a month, a couple of about, uh, I think Acts 28, am I right? Yeah. Acts 28 about Paul's shipwreck. I thought this was always interesting. Uh, King James, New King James says it this way. When the ship was coming apart, I remember that, and they did, they 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 put helps around. That word helps uh, actually is the, is the English word taken from uh, uh, the Greek word. It means ropes, and they were, they were ropes and binding. So the, the old gospel ship is coming apart. And uh, and and uh, the ship that's taken him to to his destiny, but it could not be could not happen without helps. And said at at risk of their own life, they put helps and they bound up the ship and they wrapped the ship so that it wouldn't come apart in the storm. You're, that's what help says. You're ministry. getting me fired up. And and they cut off the life raft. And they cut off, which is the opposite of what somebody who has a natural skill set would say. So right? that no one can they escape. They threw the food over. Yep. And he'd be like, oh, well, the boat's heavy. No, like they needed to survive. And he goes, get rid of all of it. Like eat and get rid of everything. Yep. And they were on that thing 14 days. So, so, and I think it parallels with the word of wisdom, mm -hmm. right? Where it's information given to you by God mm -hmm. for a situation that God is speaking to, to take it further, to bless it, to grow it. But it doesn't come from your natural wisdom it can parallel with it it can fall along with that but you need to look at apostle prophet teacher evangelist those are the gifts of administration those are the gift of help as they treat it unto a calling it is a holy thing it isn't a skill it is a calling and when you have people that function they go listen we're gonna throw the ropes around yep. and you're like hold on these are like this is a massive boat with 300 people and you're talking about like some old timey rotten ropes they're not going to hold it together and, and it, yeah, I could go on and on because most of the time, the solutions that God gives in those situations through those ordained, you know, uh, I can come up with five examples. Uh, take the boys, uh, loaves and fishes, mm -hmm. right? But how far will they go among so many? That's what he says, right? He's like, but this is the solution that God has. 
And even in the middle of these, like, but I don't even think it's going to work, but this is what I have. So there has to be faith. And right before he asked the disciple, he goes, how would you, how would you feed all these people? He goes, eight, eight months wages wouldn't buy enough for each one to have a bite. He actually was in a, a numerical administrator. He answered the question correctly. It was a question about finance. He answered it accurately, and he was wrong. Being accurate in the natural isn't always, isn't always the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so these, the, I just, when you talk about help, uh, helps and, and all these gifts, it's like people just go, oh, well, they just kind of settle into their comfort zone. Heck, no. Like, it needs to be treated with holiness and, and, and devotion as you would expect any any prophet, apostle, teacher, evangelist to carry that gift well. It, and it is, not a, it is not a gift that you just kind of like coast on and be like, oh, I'm really gifted. No. Yeah. Sorry. No, gonna... that's great. I like it. So since we're there, we took a little dip. So, so the ship finally did come apart. It did. It did. It came apart. Yeah. So you're going to do the analogy as, as, as where we're at now. We'll set Joseph aside for a second. I like this. Uh, and that the ship came apart. It says, and they all made it to land on different pieces of the ship. Yeah. I kind of like that. <laughs> yeah, different pieces of the ship. I mean, everybody's not going to get there the same way. You know, you had, yeah. you know, the Word of Faith ship, and you had yeah. the Methodist ship, and, the, and the, then you had the, you know, the prophetic piece of wood, and, yeah. but they all made it ashore. They did. They did. And I thought this when you said that, I thought this was interesting too, when Paul, you know, like uh, uh, before the great... Uh, uh, healing happened on the islands, you know, with uh, the chief of the island and the others that were healed. He built the fire, and the snake came out of the fire. There's a snake in every fire. There's a snake in every fire. And the way I know there's a fire, if there's a snake, and there's big snake, big viper. I mean, there's a big snake loose in this nation, this earth right now. That tells me there's a fire. And so what do you do? You, he, th he shook it back into the fire. He put that, in other words, the snake itself got burned up in the fire. And whatever is happening negatively in this world, it will be cast back into that fire. Yeah. And uh, because uh, that is if we have this, the same capacity that Paul did to shake it off into the fire, didn't, yeah. didn't scream and run and, yeah. and try to cast it out. He shook yeah. it back into the fire. And, and, and so speaking to this, he goes from a, gosh, I could talk about this forever, so I'm not. He goes from being a prisoner to being captain of the boat yeah. to basically taking over the whole island. So you're talking about people having yeah. doors open up, being launched into their yeah. destiny. This was Paul. Paul was a prisoner at the beginning. He was. And, but, but on Malta, he becomes yeah. a god. The Bible says that he shook the snake back okay. into the fire. He suffered no ill effects. And they look at him and go, yep. you're a god. And he's like, giddy up. I'm, let me pray for some people. And they bring him in to, yeah. the, top, to the top mansion on the entire island. And... and and so, like, you can push your door open and work your way into a mansion, but it's totally different when God brings you there through obedience. And what I love about where did the snake come from? The snake came because Paul, after he saved 300 men from obedience, crashed on the island, and he serves. He goes around and collects firewood. So Paul takes the role of a servant, gets bit because of that. And, and we can't neglect that. Our, our job in all of this is to serve. It isn't to be at the top. If the Lord wants to bring you to the nicest mansion in all of a nation, he will do that faster than you can, better than you can. The Bible says they celebrated, they, they, they entered into a, like a feast or a celebration for three days. They were entertained hospitably. Ain't no party like a Malta party. And... And that was, so like everybody's in the middle of the storms like, I just want a break. God will give you a bigger break when he opens up the door. Not when you just like, oh, I just need to step out for a little while because ministry's too much or this is too much. No, in obedience, no matter what's going on, he knows exactly what you need when you need it. And he will open up the doors into the biggest mansions. Yes. I thought before you into that, I thought it was interesting that before the ship even broke apart, Paul said, an angel of the Lord visited me tonight and said, there shall be loss of the ship, but not one soul. And that's what I, I think we're trying to say. New doors open to him that there. There's a new door open for us. There may be a loss of the ship, but not our own lives. 
the ship is going down. The ship may come apart, whether it be the economy, whether it be, it doesn't matter. No harm, it said, but no harm shall come to anyone. But the ship is going, Paul said, trust me, because an angel stood before me tonight and told me the ship is going to break. See, we're, we're, we're praying for the ship. The angel said, don't worry about the ship. You know, and, uh, and if it does come apart, little pieces of it are there for you to get to land on. But anyway. Can I, so, can I just throw one little nuggy in there and then I'm done? I sure, it'll cost I'll you, but go ahead. Yes. Before Paul gets on the boat, he, he says this. Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to a ship and cargo and to our own lives as well. Uh, and he was wrong. And he was wrong. Yes. Yep. Anyone yeah. can look at the calendar, can look at the weather, and go, it's going to yep. be bad. That's not the yep. prophetic. Right. It's not. Anyone can doubt that's easy, but who's the one that listens to the word of the Lord, that listens to the angelic visitation, that listens to the dream that he has? The Lord speaks to him three times on that ship, yep. three times, three different ways, and he gets rejected for obedience. The first time he goes, hey, the Lord said it's going to get bad. They're like, shut up. And then when it gets bad, they come to him. Rejection is not a sign that you've missed him. Say it again rejection is not, is not a sign that you missed him right. if your focus is on the praise of man. Right. If you actually are obedient, he's mm. in the rejection. I'm turning it off. Okay. We'll, let's get off. We'll get back and we'll get back to this. Yes. I like that. Like, yes. That is an unscripted detour. I like those. Joseph's attitude in the prison determined his altitude in the throne. Big deal. He, had an ad, if he didn't have an attitude problem, problem. His attitude in the prison determined his altitude for the nation. I, I ain't going to say more about that because I have to work it on myself. Number seven, I can only fly as high as I'm willing to rise above the chaos around me. That was Joseph. What chaos was around him? I say, Lord, would you tell, you know, I can fly, only fly as high as I'm willing to rise above the chaos that's around me. We're not called to coddle chaos. We're called to be above it all. And that's hard. Because if you got a TV and you watch it, that's hard. Because a lot of crazy stuff is happening. If you if you feel if you're a feeler, that's hard. A lot of crazy stuff is happening. A lot of chaos. The world is in chaos more than you may know, more than the news media knows, more than people. Know. I mm, the world is in trouble right now, and uh, the Joseph scenario is very critical. But with every famine that comes, like with Pharaoh. Never crash that happened. God is not without a Joseph in the bottom of the prison yeah. to interpret what's going on and to bring a solution to it. Joseph, we are solution makers. We are problem solvers. If we can stop fighting between ourselves long enough. We are that. We are that. And when we come together, you think that Democrats came together, Republicans come together. Wait till the church comes together. Right. My gosh. Will we, will we, are we independents? I don't know. If we're independent, I don't know. I don't know what we are, but boy, that's... Anyway, <laughs> let me run, finish this real quick. That the world doesn't need my critique. It needs my kindness. It doesn't need my critique. It needs my kindness, and it needs my forgiveness. And Joseph had both of those, if you remember that. He, he forgave. Uh, and um, and I, I, I don't want to go through this again, but it, that was... But, this particular thing about Joseph, when he forgave his brothers, you know, they're the one that threw him in a well and sold him for slavery, and, 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 and his life was miserable. He goes to Potiphar's house. He was accused of something he didn't do. He was sent to the prison. Now he's with a butler and the baker in the prison. Then when he gets out, his brother comes because now he's the head of the deal, and he's got the money and the gold, and, and he just embraces them without forgiveness. What a picture of forgiveness. The church will never ascend to the throne of favor and rule the world unless they forgive their enemies. We'll never do it. Forgiveness is a big deal. And I've told you the story before. I won't tell you the story, but 
uh, uh, the Lord gave me a scary dream about being a Joseph. And, um, and I won't go to the story again with Kenneth Copeland. You know, it, um, and uh, he and I had a little interaction back in the 70s where, you know, I took him fishing, goes to the conference that he was doing to our church. And uh, I just didn't like him. I just didn't like him because he would go, boy, he called me boy all the time. And I thought, well, first of all, he's from Texas, which is another country, as far as I was concerned, was, you know. And um, <laughs> he took, we'd go, let me say, we'd go fishing, and, and we went fishing. He took, I took him, my job was to take him fishing as, as assistant pastor there. Took him fishing in the lake by our church, took him fishing, and he got in the boat, he looked at me, he said, boy, bless God, hallelujah, I'm going to catch five times more fish than you do. Hallelujah, praise his name, Hallelujah. <laughs> And I'm thinking, oh, boy, you done met an ark. I can outfish you. Well, he did. He caught yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. two times much more. And I, I liked him even less uh, <laughs> than that. And so I thought, I'm going to just really just nail him. I follow him up to the sanctuary, uh, the pavilion on top of the hill, and I say, uh, Brother Coleman, can I ask you a question? And I said, what do you think about balance? There's a lot of imbalance. I met him. Yeah. This is a young man, <laughs> smart aleck. But anyway, I said, what do you think about balance? And he said, boy, balance is another word for compromise. <laughs> and I go, okay, now I don't like you. Now I know I don't like you. Anyway, long, long story short. So I go to bed that uh, two nights after he leaves, I go to bed. And I, went, and, in the, and I have a dream. I go to the dream. I have the dream that I'm in this house and I'm a hound dog. I'm a hound dog. And at somebody, a hound dog, an old hound, a dog that's a, a basset hound. Big ears. And I look at, I got paws and I got ears and they're dangling. And, I, and, I, and somebody's in this house and I can see the furniture. It's really big. And it's a vision dream in the house. And I, I go, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm a dog. I'm in somebody's house. I look up and Kenneth Copeland's sitting in a big old chair looking down and he goes, hey boy. <laughs> he said, go out and get my sneakers. Go get my slippers. And my little doggy heart was like, yeah. And I run out. I got them in my mouth. They come up and I go, he goes, good boy, good boy. Good. And then I go, ah. And I wake up screaming going, ah. I go, Lord, what was that? And he said, remember, Joseph, you will always wind up serving those that you reject and not forgive. And I go, I love him. I love him. <laughs> He's a fisherman and a half. <laughs> Actually, we connected years later, and I told this story. He heard about it, but he thought it was funny. And anyway, so that was that was. Can I, can I tell you just the two second? Yes. With him? Yes. For years. I would actually preach. Against him? Yeah. Yeah. I but did too. When we were in our worst financial season in Iris, yeah. and I was getting ready to lay off, lay off six people, uh, a check came in with his name on it, yeah. with a handwritten letter he had never given before. And he said, yeah, just wrote the sweetest thing, and I just repented. Yeah. No, I we think we know who people are. That's Humble, true. sweet, and yeah, yeah, anyway, I'm sorry. Joseph was a man of forgiveness, and that is probably one of the missing elements, I think, in, in the DNA of the church right yeah. now. Is, is, and, and, and a lot of it's, you know, we have been hurt, and people have hurt us, and I, but get over it. But anyway, what's that? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. You will wind up serving those you reject and dishonor and, uh, yeah, and don't forgive. You'll wind up serving them. Like Joseph. He says Joseph's half-brother and served him. They're, they reject. But he opened his arms too. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in darkness, and he does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. Yeah. Can't have unforgiveness. Jesus, Jesus said, uh, talk about a story. So if you don't forgive, you'll be turned over to tormentors. And you wonder, why am I tormented? But at any rate, um, a lot of unforgiveness in the nation, not just the church, but the nation. Let me blow through these real quick. Let's go. Let Joseph learned to honor down before he honored up. In other words, he honored a butler and a baker before he ever honored a king. We don't have problems honoring people in high places. We have problems honoring people in jail with us. 
are honoring the butler and the baker. So it's not just about honoring up, because honor is the currency of heaven. I mean, there's, you can, you, you know, Joseph didn't open the door through his great, you know, you know, he, helped, he opened the door to Pharaoh through honor. It wasn't through anything other than that. So I, I, I feel the Lord told me years ago to never try to kick a door down that you can't open through honor. We, we try to kick too many doors down instead of honor. You honor a door. You honor someone, they'll open every door in their house, every door in their ministry. So honor is a big deal. Satan was thrown out of heaven because of dishonor. And he was the most anointed one there at the time. But uh, dishonor was found in his heart. Dishonor is, dishonor is a poverty of soul. It is a spirit of poverty, poverty that doesn't have enough of its own to praise what someone else had. It, this, it's the worst spirit of poverty you can have is dishonor. Yeah. Come on. No. But anyway, didn't mean to go there. Uh, and, flattery is not honor. No, flattery is not honor. Is right. And right. It's pride. But Joseph is standing before the king, and instead of saying, why you, you know, you know, Whatever. Uh, he just said, <laughs> he just said to him, he said, <clears throat> oh, oh, king, you know, the Lord has shown you. You know, it's such, a, such an honor. Yeah. But, but my point would be, and I move on past that, but before he got to that, he also honored on the same, in the same way just a butler and a baker who were wrong in the bottom of a prison, prophesied over them, gave them the word of the Lord, honored them, served them. And um, that's the kind of Joseph company people God is raising up that knows how to honor both down and both up. So in other words, we, we learn how to honor the smallest and the greatest, not just the greatest. 